sia in destra Yok bak görebiliyor musun? Şey, evet şu an görebiliyoruz. Ee, başlayabilirsiniz Derya Hanım. Tamam. Ee, o zaman e, direkt ben İngilizce başlıyorum o zaman. Ee, okay well. Hi everybody uh, who is taking the time to join this uh, uh, meeting this morning and afternoon in Turkey. Um, my name is Daria Ariyalaz and uh, I am uh, an economist, energy economist in Boston, uh, working in uh, energy issues with Charles River Associates. Um, I, I have a PhD in economics from University of Minnesota uh, in applied economics department. And today I'm going to talk about um, the electric vehicles and distributed solar in the United States. Uh, we have uh conducted some research with uh, a former colleague of mine Bishuan Sun and uh, wrote a paper about um adoption decisions in electric vehicles and distributed solar in the US and I'm going to present some of the research in here and hopefully we'll have a nice conversation in the end um so just before I start I would like to um just mention that the opinion that I presenting this research is solely mine and my co-authors and it doesn't reflect really uh, my employer's um, uh, opinions or any, any any of its affiliates. So for thank you for taking the time to join this morning. Uh, so there are three main components of this presentation. I will be talking about 20-25 minutes. Uh, first, I will be covering the recent trends of distributed generation, specifically solar and electric vehicles in the United States. And then I will briefly at a high level, um, without getting into the specific modeling details, uh, talk about our modeling framework and some preliminary simulations. Uh, and note that these simulation results likely to change, but um, I really welcome any feedback. And then in the end, uh, we will go through the future research and discussion. So uh, please feel free to interrupt me with any questions. And if anything is unclear, just, uh, just let me know and I will try to um, clarify. Okay, so to start with a little bit of background, um, 2010s in the United States for energy markets has been a decade of um, transformation of electricity markets. So US has really power markets specifically, uh, mostly were uh, the electric, electricity delivery, um, production and delivery was mostly owned by utilities and they controlled, uh, they generated, controlled and delivered to the customers in the past. Uh, right now, we are going through a huge transformation of um, integrated electricity network, which includes utilities as well as the customer on generation, and that changed the uh, power industry significantly in the country. Uh, this, these figures are uh, really saying this is yesterday and then this is tomorrow, but I really think uh, this is yesterday where central power stations were owning and delivering electricity. However, Right now, this is not tomorrow. We are, I think, uh, living in the world where it's more integrated uh, network now with um, utilities, generators, and third party uh, power producers and customers are being integrated into the power system where they uh, have to integrate and they have to communicate to each other to be able to uh, provide electricity in the markets. Um, this transformation really uh, created um, a shift on the demand side of the electricity markets where with, with the uptake of a lot of advanced distributed energy resources, uh, the distributed solar and electric vehicles are being the key, one, key of them are changing the demand side of the electricity markets. Now the customers are um, not a passive participant of the market, but they are more active participant of the market and they can produce electricity and interact with the grid in both ways, uh, which eventually changes the um, electricity demand patterns uh, from the customer end as well. So um, 
there are two fast growing distributed energy resources, which I will refer to their technologies in here. And this is really the focus of our research is the distributed solar, which is behind the meter. And uh, the customers are, are able to generate electricity and electric vehicles. So both has uh, a lot of benefits uh, as well as some challenges. Uh, distributed solar, the customer, once the customer installed the distributed solar on the roof, they can produce uh, electricity on site, which can help them to supply their own generation. And then electricity, electric vehicles can reduce the uh, fossil fuel dependency. However, they increase consumption for electricity because there, there will be a huge demand for, for charging. So um, just to go through the distributed solar, uh, it has been, there has been a significant increase in the residential and commercial uh, distributed solar deployment in the United States. Uh, in the residential sector, as you can see, um, there's a huge increase, like one third of the distributed solar in the United States was produced by um, small scale uh, solar installations um, or rooftop solars. And these installations have increased significantly more than seven times since 2010. Uh, in here, we only focused on residential solar, but on the commercial side, a lot of the commercial uh, distributed solar has been really led by large corporations such as Walmart, Target, uh, Google, Amazon. They, they wanted to invest in these technologies to uh, comply with the renewable standards and be, become more greener uh, companies. Uh, and so they have invested a lot of money in that. But in the residential sector, there has been a huge push to um, to install distributed solar uh, in the rooftops to be able to, to for customers to be to generate their own electricity. Uh, one of the major barrier for uh, adoption of these technologies have been the cost, and for solar, which was the solar was for solar especially was the cost of the technology. I'm saying was because technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, there has been a huge decline in the uh, price per watt of the solar uh, cost. Uh, this figure represents both residential and non-residential um, cost of technology. And in the residential side, as you can see from the graph that the price per watt has declined from $13 to $3.7 in, in 18 years. So it's, it's really a huge decline. And also there has been a huge, um, uh, is support by the policy incentives and alternative financing. So uh, there has been third party leasing options and um, companies try to figure out uh, a cheaper way to have the customers to install solar. So it's more attractive to the customers and, and therefore uh, there has been a huge deployment as the cost barrier was um, diminishing in the, in the country. On the electric vehicle side, it's still, uh, they are still a small fraction of the to total commercial vehicle sales in the United States. Um, in other words, not everybody is going out there and buying a Tesla. Uh, they are, uh, the, uh, customers are still, there's an educational side of it as well as uh, non-educational, which is the cost side of it. Uh, the biggest barrier for EV adoption is cost and customer preferences. Um, so for, in terms of the cost, it's expensive to buy an electric vehicle. Uh, retail prices, I did a little bit of research on like, what is the current retail prices for most uh, trendy cars, electric cars in the United States. And the, the amount ranges from $25,000 to $75,000. Um, and the cost is declining. Uh, there, there's a huge significant decline in the cost of electric vehicles. Although um, uh, there has been a lot of, um, uh, technology advancements that also decrease the uh, cost of uh, lithium ion batteries uh, and that therefore therefore the electric vehicle costs have, have been declining um, since 2010 as well. Uh, but also another cost that the customers have to um, handle is the charging costs. So uh, one of the biggest challenges for having an electric vehicle is you you need the infrastructure at home because the entire country is not really designed or not ready, uh, readily available for charging stations um, in everywhere. So of course there are states like California that they have a lot of charging infrastructure, it helps customers to charge their cars outside the 
home, outside their homes, but um, it, in a lot of the states, uh, they don't have such infrastructure and therefore customers have to pay for their charging costs, which is the additional bill for their electricity consumption. And on the non-monetary side, customer preferences, uh, which we have heavily spent our time on uh, to see uh, how customer preferences affect adoption, uh, they, they, they, there are some limitations having uh, electric vehicles. So um, first of all, you may not be able to drive uh, long mileages with, um, with an electric vehicle because you need to charge. But on the other hand, with a gas-fueled car, it's it's much easier because you can stop and buy gas, and or you can drive the car for a week uh, for, with a with a full, full tank. Um, and it may also, you know, require more charging. So you may have to charge the car on a daily basis. Versus, as I just mentioned, that um, you can you you can just fill up a tank and then drive to the, to another state um, easily with it with with one one uh, one char uh, one fueling. So there are some barriers for EV adoption and um, solar, we are overcoming the challenges, but EV is still uh, getting there. Uh, and there are also some other um, charging uh, patterns that affect the customer's ability to, ability to, um, to use their car. So co consumers, you know, charge uh, on peak versus off peak hours. And this really affects uh, the customer's preferences for uh, driving an electric vehicle. So uh, I just sort of listed here what what would it look like if you are charging during peak hours versus off peak hours. So peak hours, as you may you may know, that it's when the price of electricity is really the highest and the highest demand for electricity is, is um, in place. And off peak hours are really defined as the hours that uh, not a lot of people are using the electricity and it's when the electricity prices are, are the cheapest. So um, when you are charging during peak hours, which is usually during the day, um, customers, you, they, they may not need the char charging infrastructure on site because it, it's possible that they are charging in their workstation or somewhere outside the charging station on their way. So that gives them an ability to um, drive during the day. Um, however, this increases the peak load and uh, increases the cost of electricity and therefore there's a lot of implications on the grid and heavy demand um, can actually cause a lot of disruptions uh, for electric generators during the day. Um, however, on the other hand, charging during off-peak hours, um, customers potentially are charging their, uh, their vehicles at home so that they potentially need the infrastructure in their homes um, and they potentially pay less for charging because they are doing uh, the charging activity overnight, which is the cheapest time of electricity. However, um, driving during the days may be more limited because they may have to go, you know, additional mileages and they can't, they can't afford to drive um, more than X miles given the car they have. So in order to control for on-peak, off-peak uh, in the US utilities, um, electric companies offer um, a lot of charging rates. So the figure, uh, I, I think I took this from Bloomberg Energy, uh, they, they uh, offer charging rates that are designed to shift demand to off-peak hours because it's hard on generators to have this heavy charging load during peak hours. So these are the companies uh, in, the, in the figure, these are on the left side, these are the companies that um, uh, mostly in California, Chicago, and Texas area, um, they have different rate structures to push customers or incentivize customers to charge during off-peak hours. And um, uh, de depending on the region and, and the load structure, this tariff design will change, obviously, because the demand is not the same everywhere. And as you know, U.S. electricity markets has uh, regional um, power markets, which also uh, affect uh, the company's design of rates and um, and uh, prices for the electricity that they that they offer for their customers. Therefore, the adoption of electric vehicles across the country is really non-uniform. And um, given the infrastructure 
uh, inconsistencies also, we see uh, any, a, a non-uniform uh, distribution of electric, electric vehicle adoption uh, across the United States. Um, well, given these barriers, there are also some incentives and um, initiatives that help deployment of these technologies. Um, at the federal level, investment tax credits for solar um, has helped the solar customers to, you know, uh, to, to um, recover some of their initial investment cost. However, um, a lot of these incentives um, can expire in the future. And there are some federal tax credits, so the cash rebates uh, for electric vehicles. And at the state level, um, state level initiatives have been more um, uh, proactive and more, pro uh, more helpful for uh, customers. So at the state level for distributed solar, state net metering uh, really helped uh, solar customers to recover their costs. So the way it works is that customers with rooftop solar uh, can generate electricity on site and they can use that electricity for their own purposes or for the excess amount that they generate, they can sell it back to the grid. And for the amount that they sell it back to the grid, they get paid by, um, by, the, by the companies. So um, it used to be that when the first net metering programs came out, uh, customers were paid the full amount. So for example, if you're paying like 10 cents per megawatt for your electricity, um, then when you generate electricity, you are getting paid 10 cents for the excess amount that they provide, that you provide to the grid. However, now because of uh, the cross subsidy uh, problem where the customers that don't own the uh, solar custom, it's, it's being unfair for the customers without the uh, solar uh, technology. And still these customers with solar can actually they, they actually use still the grid infrastructure when even though when they are generating electricity, the states have started to revise their uh, net metering policies. So a lot of the states, uh, they started to um, charge extra for customers who have solar or they do not pay for the full amount in the retail rate, but they pay partial back to the customers who actually generate electricity. Um, and I think in the next slide, I give some examples. I mean, in every state, um, every state they have their own um, uh, way of revising the programs, but almost in every state that we see that with the net metering that we see some sort of revision uh, because solar adoption has been such a big, uh, a big driver in the country that, that they, they have to, um, they have to, they had to revise because of the costs being uh, ridiculously low. And on the EV side, um, there are states that offer cash rebates. So for example, I, I provide here two examples, Salt River, River Project SRP is a utility um, and they provide $3,000 cash rebates if you buy a Nissan Leaf. In California, residents may receive up to $7,000 if you buy a zero emission car. So there are some cash lump sum payments for electric vehicles um, uh, if you if you end up purchasing a new vehicle that is uh, zero emission or or it's electric electric vehicle, um, so the the other aspect of I mean there are a lot of barriers and uh, and benefits of having uh, or challenges and uh, a lot of uh, incentives for having uh, EV and uh, electric vehicles and solar in the country, but also. Um, they are not separate anymore. So these technologies are not being thought separately. Uh, right now, a lot of utilities have a lot of incentive to bundle these technologies together um, for, for the customers so they can actually benefit more. So if you, the, the, with the increasing demand for EV charging, uh, utilities see an opportunity for market expansion for distributed solar and bundle. Uh, they call it the hybrid. Uh, EV plus solar deployments can have number of benefits um, to the customers in terms of costs uh, as well as to the grid. So uh, to give an example, uh, with an EV and like a bundled EV and solar uh, customer, you can reduce the demand spikes and increase the peak load um, during charging in the, mean, in the morning. So uh, sun usually 
provides energy during the day. And so having solar generation during the day and for a customer that owns an EV actually can bundle together and you can charge your car with a solar and that will be a lot of heavy lifting for the grid. Um, so customers can save a lot of money. So they just don't pay for charging, but they actually charge their own car with their own electricity. And this is potentially uh, less pressure on the grid and less probability for outages and voltage control issues and, and things like that. And now there's the new uh, uh, managed charging approach has been trending and utilities are trying to um, figure out how could customers with these advanced technologies can actually uh, be managed charging. Uh, so a lot of the, I mean, these managed charging can be with or without solar. Um, you know, a utility or a, a third party can control charging by turning in, it up or down remotely uh, a customer's charging uh, charging uh, infrastructure or a charging equipment. Uh, or if you bundle it with solar and timing, bundle through timing of charging and solar generation, it can actually automatically be managed as I just described and can be very beneficial uh, for, for the electric grid. So a lot of the uh, new upcoming uh, trends for advanced distributed energy resources to how to bundle these resources together so they can actually be beneficial for both for the customers and for the, uh, for the grid. So uh, before I get into the uh, get into our research, uh, we did a huge uh, literature review on uh, what has been done on adoption of distributed energy resources, solar and EV in particular. Um, we've looked at industry studies, um, meaning a lot of white papers and uh, pay, uh, consulting reports and and. Uh, utility company models that that has been out there and what we have really found that uh, a lot of the studies in the industry have really focused on benefit cost analysis of distributed energy resources from mostly an individual generator perspective and they call it value of solar or value of distributed energy resources and these studies have really provided um, uh, a point in time uh, value of solar or any kind of distributed energy generation um, uh, to, to, uh, from, from a perspective on an individual generator. On the academic side, uh, we have reviewed a lot of journal articles and we have found a number of studies with uh, optimization models, uh, which we also have developed one. And a lot of the focus of the optimization models was to understand having these technologies and their impact on demand for electricity. Uh, and then there are also studies that they have tried to address uh, or the relationship between the adoption of electric vehicles uh, and solar. So how they can be interacting in terms of um, more, more recent studies, I would say that they would be trying to understand how uh, having a solar uh, and an electric vehicle uh, beneficial or how do they interact uh, given uh, some price or other uh, triggering uh, effects in, in their modeling schemes. And then there has been some uh, revealed preferences studies, uh, which are mostly based on surveys and empirical uh, analysis of these survey uh, outcomes that try to understand what would be the customer's willingness to pay or accept um, electric vehicles for electric vehicles or uh, distributed energy resources. So uh, there is, a lot of studies out there that are really um, looking at this issue from very different perspectives. And in our study, what we have really um, tried to do uh, and contribute uh, to this discussion is really to try to understand, I will just do this, um, try to understand the optimal adoption decision from a consumer's perspective uh, and optimal driving mileages given consumer preferences. Obviously, our model is driven by a lot of the cost, but we really try to understand what would be the driving preferences given different customer preferences. And our model is really solving for optimal decision to purchase um, EV, electric vehicle, or a conventional vehicle that is using fossil fuels. And we try to understand um, 
what would be the optimal decision for a customer to purchase EV, conventional vehicle, or electric vehicle and distributed solar together. And then the model also produces optimal miles driven per hour, and everything is really given uh, the, the varying customer preferences. So the important, uh, the, the thing that we focused in our study is really the customer's preferences. And we didn't assume that they are homogeneous. So we, we assume that they, they vary among, among customers. So uh, what we've done is really, I, before I get into the simulations and um, they are <laughs> somewhat, uh, it may not be you know, intuitive to everybody on the call, but uh, I'm happy to explain further offline the model uh, behind it, uh, but just interrupt me with questions if you, if you have. So what we have done is we have done some baseline simulations. Uh, we've uh, collected some data and simulated some uh, some uh, some stuff, and we've tested the impact of you know changes in policy incentives, on peak versus off peak charging, and technology costs on the adoption decision. And also, we've uh, tried to understand the subsequent impact on on load profile for these customers. So, um, so I will begin my uh, simulations explanation. And uh, one of the important things to know about this model is that we have um, assumed um, that this utility function, which is uh, called Douglas utility function and alpha, which is the consumer's level of satisfaction that ranges between zero and one. We just assume the uniform distribution, but this can obviously be changed, but this is just for uh, preliminary um, showing purposes. And obviously any feedback is welcome. And what alpha really represents, and a lot of the results that I will be presenting is really associated with alpha, uh, indicates that customers enjoys the higher alpha means consumers enjoys driving, consumer, the, the consumer that we have enjoys driving electric vehicle more, but in diminishing returns. So this is the utility function, uh, utility uh, of the customer, and then this is the marginal utility. And, um, what we, uh, and X is the miles driven. So as alpha goes up, uh, we see higher utility for from an EV customer's perspective. And above a certain level of alpha, we see a jump that the customer enjoys um, more driving the electric vehicle. Obviously this is in diminishing returns as, as the, um, as the, um, Mile just go up, the, the, the utility goes down as well. Um, so one of the biggest finding of this research that we, we, we've identified is we've simulated the results when allowing for the customer to charge between on peak hour, in during on peak hours versus off peak hours and to see how um, optimal miles driven changes uh, given these uh, mileage, uh, given these uh, peak versus off-peak charging uh, times. And we defined on-peak hours 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. And I realized this is not, um, this is not, you know, consistent across the entire country. Obviously, this, this timeline can be different for different regions. But generally, most of the heavy peak demand in the U.S. is between 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. And then off-peak hours, we have assumed um, the rest of the hours in a given day. Uh, and we assume that in this model that consumers have the infrastructure, charging infrastructure at home. So it's obviously charging off peak hours is, is a lot cheaper. And so what we find in the figure is uh, the Y axis is optimal miles driven. And then the uh, X axis is the alpha. So with, with optimal miles driven is highest, um, as you can see with the blue line, when the customer charges during off-peak hours. This is um, an intuitive outcome because charging during off-peak hours is cheaper. And on the conventional vehicle side, we see a lot flat outcome. And the, the shape of the curve, you may some of you may ask, like, why is this declining after certain alpha? Um, this is literally the functional form that we have assumed, and uh, we are currently testing whether this is going to be changing with different functional forms. But the, the ultimate finding here is that the off-peak hours, during char charging during off-peak hours is much more optimal for the customer to have um, 
to charge during off peak hours versus in off on peak hours it's the next best for the customer and then uh and then cv is being the least optimal uh, choice and next what we have um tested is the net metering incentives uh, whether it affects uh, the adoption decision. So as you may just remember, I just mentioned net metering was an incentive for solar, uh, distributed solar customers. So if you have solar generation at home, you get paid for your excess generation of electricity. And the amount that you get paid really affects the, um, the decision to whether adopt uh, EV plus solar. Um, so as you can see from the figure that there are four outcomes that we have done the simulation for. The first one is our baseline, uh, and we don't see EV plus solar is an optimal um, decision for customer. It's either EV, given these uh, alpha values, or uh, it's a conventional vehicle. And if you increase the uh, level of net metering incentive, you see a higher um, uh, alpha being uh, well, actually, yeah, if you increase the net metering uh, structure, if you increase the net metering value that you get um, EV plus solar as, as an optimal outcome, instead of just having the EV, the consumer prefers uh, EV plus solar together. And if you increase that even further, that we, you see the consumer has a wider range of alpha, so enjoys more driving the EV and also has EV plus solar uh in their in their um, optimal choice and finally um we have tested try to sort of uh illustrate the the revised uh net metering program with additional demand charges we have added an extra demand charge for the customers meaning that they are not getting paid in full for their um for their uh electric uh, electricity generation and we see that uh, with the demand charges electric ev plus solar is now not an option it's not an optimal decision for a customer to have and also the the alpha range is a lot smaller when the customer has to pay for extra demand charges um, so this really illustrates um, that net energy metering policies have a significant impact on having ev plus solar um, solar as an option and, and net metering policies should be really um, thought uh, carefully in terms of their revision and how, how to implement going forward. Um, the other thing that we have looked at is the daily mileage is traveled um, with, with the similar net metering. And we see that the daily miles traveled, the customer enjoys a lot more um, when they have a higher um, net metering incentive. So the, the consumer really switches from uh, conventional to uh, not, uh, EV plus solar or EV with a higher level of net metering uh, structure. And finally, uh, we have tested the model for the cost of, um, the cost of uh, technology. So we, we try to understand if the solar cost of solar has gone down, uh, what would be the uh, adoption decision from this consumer's perspective? And we see for a cheaper uh, solar, uh, we see that full adoption of EV plus solar. If, if the technology becomes cheaper, then, then, then the adoption is going to be easier and it's going to be bundled EV plus solar. But as you increase the cost of technology, then, then you start to see that the optimal decision no longer uh, being EV plus solar, but it's, um, it's only EV and also the alpha value, the customer's enjoyment from this, um, from this technology is also a lot narrower than, than wider. So these are just preliminary, I mean, I don't want to call them preliminary, obviously we have really finished this analysis, but they are they are to, to test the model to see if it's working and anything is making sense. Uh, what our really uh, focus has been that we've tried to understand if we were to do uncontrolled versus controlled EV charging, uh, whether this model can give some idea of how 
the managed charging would look like and, and, and whether it has some implications on load management. Uh, so this first case is, is the uncontrolled EV charging. So in the figure that you see uh, that the, the, the orange line is the electric vehicle charging load and um, solar production is, is the blue and then net, net load is which is the EV minus solar is the green, um, green uh, line. And we've generated this uh, solar data using some solar radiation data. We've came up with a solar shape. And then charging profile is actually from Department of Energy's uh, national normalized charging demand from EV. So we've, if, if we have adopted to calibrate the model. And this is a representation of an uncontrolled um, EV charging with solar. But in the next illustrative case, if controlled charging was um, in place and EV was bundled with solar, um, you see that the outcome where that, that we see that proposed EV load aligns with solar production and therefore the net solar curtailment, net, net uh, solar, net, net load has become almost zero, which has zero impact to the grid as a lot of um, utilities are trying to accomplish. So. Um, this this can be accomplished. What what what is important in here is that the the total if the total additive um, load in here in this figure is equal to this one. It's only the total amount is shifted to a line, um, and the customer aligns this given given the optimization, and it, it ends up being um, ends up being this net load being almost zero which has zero impact on the grid and the customer really pays for its own charging um, charging infrastructure. And this also in addition has a lot of benefits in terms of reduction in need for solar curtailment during the day. Sometimes um, there's excess generation. So there are a lot of curtailments. So this can be avoided by uh, controlled EV charging. And this is really smoothing out the peak, uh, peak generation or uh, peak demand uh, during the day and uh, right now, we are trying to improve uh, this by adding some some color to this, a little bit more um, stochasticity to the model uh, to see how it's going to change. So this is really everything is done in deterministic in this model, but um, our our really next level analysis would be just to uh, understand what would be the uncertainty in. Um, either a tax credit or or a price of electricity um, or even fuel prices can have an impact on on this um, outcome. So this is overall um, the uh, the results from our study, and I just wanted to mention. I mean, everything is uh, everything is really COVID related these days, and uh, this is really not. Um, uh, part of our research, but uh, we are working on another piece of work that uh, are that is trying to understand demand uh, implications of COVID-19. And um, this is just um, just note that there's no analysis behind this, and this is just my understanding of this uh, data I presented in the graph. Is that we have collected some ISO uh, level. Uh, there are some regional markets, as I mentioned, in the U.S. and um, we have looked at six major markets um, and their historical load uh, and what, what really uh, happened in 2020. And this figure really has the first four months of every year. So it, it only has the load shape is uh, only from January through uh, end of April. Uh, so it has the daily average load shape for, for every year. And as you can see in 2020, we, we, we have some shifting down and the peak has been changing. So potentially this will have an impact on, I mean, this definitely has impact on power markets in general and the customer demand and everything else. But from a uh, distributed energy resources perspective, uh, the two potential impacts on dis distributed energy resources is two ways, basically, they are two opposite conclusions. But the first one is, um, in the short run, uh, EV, solar, or hybrid technologies deployment may slow down um, 
due to the impact on general macroeconomy and um, their electric vehicle sales may go down and uh, solar companies are already uh, publishing that the short run effects will be a downturn in adoption of these technologies. But also going forward in the long run, customers may become more and more encouraged um, to become self-sufficient uh, for events like uh, COVID-19 and, and hurricanes. Uh, the, the, they, these shocks to the, um, shocks to the economy and, and the daily life may actually encourage customers to be more self-sufficient in terms of their electricity generation and, and other, other needs. And therefore they may in the long run um, think about having an electric vehicle and having a solar uh, generator at home and bundling and generating their own electricity and become much more um, uh, their own solo uh, generator in their homes. So this is these are obviously two areas of research, um, but uh, there will be an impact on, on distributed energy generations going forward given, given COVID-19. Um, I guess, before I finish, I mean, in, in future research, we continuously, uh, Bishwan and I are actively writing in this area and we have published several papers before. Um, and we, we will continue to do a little bit more research on um, applications on demand charges and more on the load shifting applications. Um, and so uh, if you are interested and want to learn more about this, obviously just reach out to me. But this is all I have, and uh, thank you for your participation. I can take any questions you might have. Uh, otherwise, just feel free to send me comments uh, or questions to my email. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Aliumas. Uh, we have one question from YouTube. And okay. That is, uh, what is the electricity price for California residents? Which companies are operating? I saw some low electric prices, nine cents per kilowatt hour, but is it given because of low EV number? Is it because of a low EV? Actually, this is a very good question. So I, I will pull up that slide. Um, so most of the companies here, as you can see, I think they are referring to this. Uh, um, they are referring to this uh, graph is Southern California Edison, SPG&E, PG&E, um, LADWP. Uh, these are California utilities. So um, they are uh, trying to give different tariffs. Uh, and California, I mean, these are the rates. Basically, if you if you look at this, uh, you get during off peak, if you charge your car, you pay number kilowatt hour. Uh, but if you charge during on peak hours, you pay 17 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's really um, almost doubling the cost of charging and trying to device customers push this times blue areas versus purple. Um, and PGE has an extreme, uh, which is, I mean, PGE itself, it's going through some, some financial issues, but um, 25 cents per kilowatt hour or 45 cents per kilowatt hour, it's, they are trying to push out customers to move their charging load to off-peak hours. In terms of, uh, I mean, it's hard to answer what is the price of electricity in California uh, because it may vary by company. And although, you know, California Public Utilities Commission really, really, um, uh, determines the rate. There is a lot of um, companies that they are uh, serving in, in the in the area. So therefore, um, there's not one single price for electricity for for retail customers. The, the, that, as you can see from the figure, it, it varies. Um, and California is actually one of the highest um, EV infrastructure and charging stations um, state. So we see that California has one of the highest electric vehicle adoption in the, in the US. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions. Thank okay. you for the nice presentation. Uh, it was great, great having you in our uh, Bicant Energy Policy Research Center. Pujan, uh, would you like to add something? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to ask about the question, uh, alpha part of it, this alpha, if you, oh, okay. because um, 
my first question is, do you think that there are fundamental limits to alpha? That means that at most 25% of the whole households may enjoy that one because mm -hmm. it requires maintenance and other things. My question is, uh, can, you, can you briefly explain a little bit more about the alpha and if there are fundamental limits of alpha and so on? Thank you, Daria. Can I add, uh, can I add uh, to Barish's question, Daria, that, that, that also intrigued me, uh, my attention? Uh, uh, the diminishing returns uh, uh, pathway, uh, uh, was it a structural assumption uh, uh, at the background or is it uh, only an empirical finding? Uh, it's a structural assumption. Okay. It's a structural assumption. And uh, yeah, that's a good question. And Barish, yes, there is some limitations to having alpha. Uh, there's, I mean, obviously, uh, this is just, you know, have it, this doesn't really account for the broader range of um, preferences, but to your question, the short answer is yes, there are some limitations to having alpha within any uniform distribution, but um, that's something that we should think about how we can make this a little bit um, broader. Uh, Preference adoption curve, let's say, or and not. It's it, this is this is the uniform distribution. So we we are we've tried a couple other ways, but had solution um, programmatic limitations. Um, therefore, we have ended up with this assumption. But I'm happy to discuss with you further offline if you have suggestions to improve this. Okay, we Thank have you. One, one final question: uh, What was the main reason? that California had more EV? Well, they had, um, they actually have been the early adopters for a lot of these technologies. So they have the incentives in place and they have their customers being, um, uh, I, I guess, monetary and non-monetary effect were in place in there. So there were state incentives, uh, the charging infrastructures were, you know, early movers that they have adopted a lot of charging infrastructures in there. And then uh, in the customer preferences wise, California has been really progressive in terms of adopting and uptaking these technologies. And uh, therefore they have been very really proactive in uh, solar and EV and, um, and, and these distributed energy resources. I guess the, sh the answer is really both um, incentives played a role and customers' preferences played a role. They are early adopting state overall for these distributed energy resources. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ayumas. Uh, now uh, we can close our session. Uh, please continue uh, watching our uh, future videos and have a nice day. Thank, thank you me. so much for having me. Have a nice day.